In this video, I'm going to show you how to calculate the isoelectric point or PI of an amino acid. So why might you want to calculate the isoelectric point of an amino acid? Well, there's really two reasons. Number one, when you're taking your MCAT, isoelectric point is going to come up and you want to be able to easily and quickly answer those questions, as well as your biochemistry classes during your undergraduate are also going to require you to calculate the isoelectric point. So the isoelectric point is a specific point, or really a specific pH, in which your amino acid is going to have a net charge of zero. Um, so in order to understand isoelectric points, it's necessary to go back and understand pH. pH is on a scale from zero to 14, and your isoelectric point is going to be somewhere in the middle of the scale where the net charge is equal to zero. So for example, let's say it's maybe here, slightly acidic, maybe 3.7. So what this means is at this pH of 3.7, this particular amino acid is gonna have a net charge of zero. So I'm gonna start by drawing a simple amino acid with no R group, just to visualize what it's gonna look like, and then we'll get into a specific example with a real amino acid. So as we take a look at our amino acid, we'll notice that our amide group is going to be um, a proton acceptor because it's going to want to go out and deprotonate um, things that have free hydrogens on them. This also means that it would be considered very basic because bases are going to go out and deprotonate. So I feel it's important that we go back and review the mechanism to show this deprotonation step. So if you notice our um, amide now is neutrally charged, it's NH2, and it has a pair of free electrons. Those free electrons are gonna go out and perform this deprotonation. So for example, I can draw an alcohol here, and it has this hydrogen that can easily be deprotonated. Those electrons come over and boot the remaining electrons back onto the oxygen, completing the deprotonation. So now we're gonna go over and review the carboxylic acids. So I'm just gonna go ahead and draw these electrons in here. And as we notice, this has a negative charge. That's because it's been deprotonated. So anything but the most acidic environments, your carboxylic acid is gonna stay deprotonated. And that's because carboxylic acids and any acids in general are very, very strong proton donors. Therefore, as you may have guessed, carboxylic acids are gonna be considered acidic. So once again, I feel it's really important to look at the mechanism for this reaction. Um, so I'm gonna show you the mechanism for the deprotonation of the carboxylic acid. You can see I have my carboxylic acid drawn here with the hydrogen drawn with an actual bond so you can actually see the deprotonation happen. So I'll draw my deprotonated alcohol right here and that's gonna go ahead. We're gonna have our free electrons, negative charge. They're gonna come over and pull off that hydrogen, kick the electrons back on to the free oxygen on the carboxylic acid, completing the mechanism. So now I would like you to imagine that you're in a pH environment of one. So we're gonna leave our amide alone because we see here um, it's already fully protonated. But on the other hand, we need to go and protonate our carboxylic acid functional group. Now, what you see here would actually be indicative of what this amino acid would look like in the pH environment of one, for example, because we would have our amide be fully protonated as well as our carboxylic acid being fully protonated. So as you can see, our carboxylic acid is fully protonated and additionally, our amide is also fully protonated. This means our net charge would be equal to one because we have no negative charge from the carboxylic acid, but yet have a positive charge from the amide. So instead of looking what happens in a very acidic environment with, with the pH of one, let's look at an environment that's very basic with a pH of 13, for example. So as you can see, the first thing that's gonna have to happen is we are gonna have to go ahead and deprotonate our carboxylic acid. This is because carboxylic acids will become deprotonated in even relatively neutral environments, so definitely in a very basic environment, it will pretty much instantly become deprotonated. However, we can't only consider the carboxylic acid. We also need to consider our amide, which will also become deprotonated. 
Um, in this case, the environment is just so basic, we can go ahead and rip off that proton, and this is going to get rid of the positive charge on our amide as well, because the environment pH of 13 is just so basic. What this means for us is that our net charge will actually turn into a negative one. So now I wanna come back to the pH scale and kind of review what we went over. So if we know that we have a certain um, pH where we're gonna be a positive charge and a certain pH where we're gonna be a negative charge, that means somewhere in the middle, we would assume that there would be a neutral charge. And this in fact is the case. We draw our pH scale with a pH of one where we have our positive charge and a pH of 14 where we have a negative charge. Somewhere along this line in the middle, we are gonna have a neutral charge and that's our isoelectric point. So I would like to direct your attention to this table I have up here. As you can see, we have all the common amino acids as well as the pKa's of their carboxylic acid, their amide, and in some cases, the R chain if they have an R chain. This is a very useful table. I will link it in the description below. So when looking at our table, we notice that most of the carboxylic acids have a pKa of around two. For this generic example, we're just gonna say that our pKa was about two. That will just keep it nice and simple. Additionally, when we go back and review the table, we'll notice that the pKa of our amides is about nine on average. So we're just gonna say nine for this simple example. All right, so the first step to calculate PI or isoelectric point is to write down our pKa's of all of our functional groups. In this case, we're disregarding the fact we have an R group and we are just saying we have the amide group and our carboxylic acid and we're using a pKa of two and nine. Then we're gonna go ahead and fully protonate everything as if we are in a very acidic environment. So we see here we have NH3 plus fully protonated as well as our carboxylic acid being fully protonated. So now that all of our functional groups are fully protonated, we are gonna go ahead and calculate our net charge and see if it's um, a net charge is zero. And in this case, we have a positive one from our amide group and everything else has a charge of zero. So therefore our net total charge would still be one which means we still need to go ahead and try to deprotonate. We can go deprotonate the lowest pKa, which is gonna be the pKa of our carboxylic acid. We are gonna go ahead and deprotonate right there, um, bring that to a negative charge because we push those electrons back on. And as we can see now, our net charge is equal to zero. Because we determined that the net charge was equal to zero, this means we have our two pKa values to plug into our equation for pI. The equation is going to be using the pKa value of 2 and the pKa value of 9. We know that the pKa values of 2 and 9 are the correct values to plug into our equation for pI because we always use the pKa value of the functional group that was deprotonated to get us to that net zero charge and the pKa value of the functional group that would be deprotonated next to plug into our equation. So now that we've determined our pKa values, we can go ahead and write the equation for pI, which equals pI equals pKa1 plus pKa2. And that's all going to be over 2. So essentially, you're going to be taking the average of the two pKa's. So now I've gone ahead and plugged into the equation. So we see 2 plus 9 equals 2, taking the average of 2 and 9, and that is then going to go ahead and equal 5.5. So our PI value for this amino acid would be 5.5. So now we're gonna take a look at aspartic acid, which is a little bit more complicated of an amino acid given the fact that it has an R group with an actual functional group. Um, and in this case, once again, we need to find the pKa's of each of the functional groups. We're going to start with the amide group. According to our table, the pKa is approximately 9.8. Then when we look at our table, we'll find that the pKa of our carboxylic acid is going to be much lower than 9.8, as we might expect, and it actually is 2.1. So if we think back to our prior example, this will tell us that the carboxylic acid will be deprotonated before the amide. 
and this is just based off of the definition of a pKa value because at a pKa of 2.1, that means at a pH of 2.1, the carboxylic acid will be 50% deprotonated and you would need a pH of 9.8 to deprotonate the amide to 50%. However, in this case, we're not done yet because we still have our R group. And if we look on our table, it says that the pKa value for our R group is 3.9. That is unique to aspartic acid. So if you remember, just like before, we have all of our pKa's defined. Now we need to place our amino acid as if it were in an environment that had a very, very low pH that was very acidic. Um, so that means we need to go ahead and start protonating our deprotonated um, functional groups. We're going to go ahead and start and protonate the carboxylic acid on our R group as if we were in a very acidic environment and we have to go ahead and repeat the same thing for our carboxylic acid that is the main part of the amino acid to fully protonate everything as if we were in a very 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 low pH environment. We don't have to protonate the amide because it's already been protonated but now we see we have everything fully protonated and we are go ahead and ready to calculate our initial net charge and in this case we can see that our net charge is going to be plus one because our other two groups are neutral, because we see that they are fully protonated and in their fully protonated form, carboxylic acids are in fact neutral. This means we're not done yet, so we need to go ahead and deprotonate our first carboxylic acid with the lowest pKa. That gives it a negative charge, and now we can see our positive charge and our negative charge cancel out, giving us a net charge of zero. Now that we've achieved our net charge of zero, we are ready to calculate our pi, or isoelectric point. So while it may seem more complicated than before, we apply the same principles. We uh, use the pKa, which is 2.1, from the um, group that was just deprotonated, and the next pKa up in value. So we'll use 2.1 and 3.9 to calculate our pI, and we can totally disregard the pKa of a 9.8. It could have been 4, it could have been 11, it would not have mattered in this case. We only need to pay attention now to the 2.1 and 3.9. This will now allow us to go ahead and plug into our equation for PI and solve for the isoelectric point value. So just as before, I'm gonna go ahead and give you the equation for PI, which is PI equals pKa1 plus pKa2 all over two which is essentially just taking an average of the two isoelectric points that you determined to be correct based upon the procedure discussed before. So I'm just going to go ahead and plug in 2.1 plus 3.9 divided by 2. So we're just taking the average 2.1 plus 3.9 is going to equal 6. 6 divided by 2 is 3, so our PI value is going to equal 3. 